Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's the NESOSA on my slides, no Optica there. So I think the team uh, as we evolve, we'll find out. I was actually, when I was doing research for the presentation, I realized the name on the journals have changed. Uh, uh, but uh, today I kind of wanted to talk about uh, uh, like how are digital optical imaging technologies coming to what we call the front lines of healthcare? And we will uh, describe what that means. Uh, my background has been in optical imaging and a lot of its medical applications, uh, but it has mostly been on the specialty side. Like right now, when you go for some of the advanced techniques, you don't see it at a primary care location or other places where the front where we go to the for to the physician for the first time it's usually at the later stages uh, but the biggest impact probably lies more on the front line so i kind of wanted to discuss uh, uh, what are the drivers how things are moving in that direction what are the limitations so yeah i, I will continue uh, and i think if folks have any questions please feel to feel free to uh, i guess message and stop me so uh, but I cannot uh, start this presentation by expressing my gratitude to any SOSA. As Barbara mentioned, you know, I, I was, uh, I think, relatively active member. I used to come, and uh, this was my first talk on February 19, 2009, when I came to the any SOSA meeting. Uh, ben Vakic was given this talk. I did not know him before. He eventually be, ended up being my uh, postdoctoral advisor. And uh, this talk was in Waltham uh, at the Best Western TLC. Those who, of many of you who have been coming probably remember that location. Um, as a graduate student, I did not have uh, a car. And uh, so I took the, I was like, okay, I, I really am interested in this talk. This seems like a cool group, I want to go. Uh, so I, I think I got a Brandeis train station. Uh, I did not grow in the United States. I did not know that uh, in suburbs, you cannot just walk around, and especially if there is I-95 uh, in between the train station and uh, the place you're trying to go. So I was like, I, I had no idea how I'm going to uh, make to the meeting. So somebody was kind enough to uh, help me uh, reach there. But since then, for about two and a half, three years, the members of NEOS, they were uh, so generous, Barbara, Gru, David Lees, David Bez, Bill, Andrew Botkin, and so many others would uh, be kind enough to give me a ride in crazy Boston traffic and support me and uh, help me, uh, you know, do so many different things uh, as next steps in my career. So I'm extremely grateful for the society that was, uh, you know, a beginning of me moving from, uh, my education days towards industry and uh, uh, was greatly helped by the society. So all of you who are have been here for a long time, you have done great things. And uh, those who are joining the society now, uh, it's, it's a very valuable place. I went on to join a few companies, as Barbara mentioned, and uh, hopefully I can give some back. Uh, our My current company has open positions. So uh, I know that uh, one of the roles of the society is to allow, net, uh, you know, promote networking and uh, please feel free to reach out in that regard. I will mention something later. So, okay, th thank you so much again. And I will jump uh, into the topic. So uh, the digital optical uh, imaging at the front lines of healthcare. So what, what do we mean by front lines? And it's front lines means the place you go to the, see your physician for the first time or any healthcare provider for that matter. Uh, primary care has been the most common one, but we also know of urgent cares uh, are uh, growing at a very fast pace. Uh, so is retail health, like these are the CBS clinics and uh, Walgreens clinics, et cetera. And uh, during pandemic, we have definitely seen growth in home-based care where people use telemedicine and try to uh, you know, do more testing at home uh, without going to the, uh, the physician office at all. And uh, that uh, most people in the field believe that there will be a important role for that mode of healthcare coming in future. But we have quantitative data to show continuous growth in primary care revenue, continuous growth in number of urgent care facilities as measured by uh, reimbursement line items and continued growth in uh, retail clinics, which are providing healthcare in a very different fashion. So these uh, the front lines of healthcare is growing. There is a strong belief that uh, 
there is a lot of pressure on the speciality care. There are fewer physicians uh, as the population is growing, especially the aging population. Uh, the, the front lines will be the very important aspect. So that's where the major impact is going to come from. Um, now, we know what we mean by imaging. Uh, you know, there's a lot of medical imaging tools, MRI, CTs, ultrasound. Most of them currently you find in specialty care. They are often expensive. Uh, they need trained technicians to use. You have MRI technicians, you have OCT technicians, you have ultrasound technicians. And then you need specialists to interpret those images. You, that's the entire field of radiology. The, not, not everyone can understand what those images show. Now, what is of interest to us is the digital optical part as an optical society. Uh, and you know, to, just to put it simply, we have 2D, uh, and the reason I said digital, because of course, any uh, visual evaluation is an optical imaging or using a magnifying glass to see, uh, uh, you know, any pathology is optical imaging as well. But when we say digital, we mean you capture an image and you save it and try to do something else with it. And one way to look at it is there's 2D imaging where you look at the surface and then there is subsurface imaging where you can see uh, below the surface and uh, using different localization techniques. Uh, optical coherence tomography is uh, one of the most popular ones, I would say, one of the biggest market which holds uh, some uh, technique I have a little bit of background in. So we will, uh, I will discuss a little bit around OCT and how it has uh, helped in different domains and where it can go in future. So many of you are probably aware of how OCT works. I will very, give a very short introduction. Uh, it, uh, OCT, as the name suggests, it uses the coherence of the light uh, as a means for localization. Uh, the most simple uh, depiction of OCT is a Michelson interferometer, where if we assume both sides of it are a mirror, the light reflects and goes to a detector. Uh, when you have a low coherent light with a broadband light source, when you move one of the mirrors, we see interference, interference only when two mirrors are almost equidistant to each other. Uh, now, if we remove one of the mirrors and place a sample uh, in place of it, as we move the other mirror, we see interference corresponding to every layer or every strong scatterer on the map. And that's how OCD does localization in the Z direction based on the coherence of the light. Uh, for last uh, about 18 to 20 years, well, uh, the technique which has been most commonly used is Fourier domain or spectral domain or source OCD, where instead of scanning the mirror, we actually spread the light uh, into different colors and we try to measure the spectral interference, the Fourier transform of which relates to the autocorrelation of the light and we get effectively the same result. So if we have a mirror, we uh, shine different wavelengths, we study them across, uh, each, we study them individually, and depending on the distance of these two mirrors, we will see an interference fringe. More the distance, higher will be the frequency of this fringe, which means the Fourier transform will indicate the distance between the, these two mirrors. Now, again, if we replace the mirror with a sample, we will get multiple interference fringes corresponding to each different layer. And the Fourier transform of that will effectively give us the location of each strong scatterer or the layer. So that's localization using the coherence of the light or the, the broad end of the light. The, the scanning to get the other dimension, it's relatively simple. We just scan the beam on the sample and that gives the transverse uh, localization. So that's how we can create a 3D map using OCT. Now, what, uh, so there are some key technical differentiators uh, while using OCT as a subsurface imaging technique. Uh, a big one is that in OCT, the mechanism for axial localization is very different from the mechanism of transverse localization. Uh, unlike confocal microscopy, where we get axial localization by focusing the beam very tight in OCT, we don't rely on it. So we can work with a very low NA uh, optical system and still get very good axial localization. Uh, that becomes very important when OCT is used in ophthalmology because we can only focus the light uh, uh, onto the retina to a certain, uh, to, this, uh, to the numerical aperture provided by the eye itself. So it can't be very high, but we want to dissolve the retinal layers at a very high resolution. And that's where uh, the, this property of OCT becomes very useful. 
OCT is also highly sensitive. It uh, uh, that comes from the fact that it's a heterodyne or homodyne technique. That is, we have a reference beam which interferes with the sample beam. So the reference beam basically amplifies the uh, signal coming. That's why I put this equation there. The the signal really lies around the uh, is a multiplication of the reference by the sample, and that. Uh, 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 that allows us to see very weakly scattering light coming back from the samples, which effectively results into very high speed imaging that becomes uh, very important for biomedical imaging because your subjects are often in motion, so you want to image them quickly. Now, technical differentiators are important, and each, you know, every technology has them, but uh, a lot more has happened around OCG to make it successful. Uh, there are two main fields uh, uh, by the market size where OCT has been dominant. Uh, one is ophthalmology and another is cardiovascular imaging, and we will look at some of the examples. Um, in ophthalmology, OCT is uh, used to uh, manage and diagnose uh, age related macular degeneration, uh, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, in cardiovascular, OCT is actually used for intravascular imaging. So we put a catheter uh, uh, through. Uh, the femur artery, take it all the way to the heart and scan inside the artery uh, for specific reasons, some of which we will discuss later. Um, but OCT has seen some exponential, like uh, seen exponential growth in multiple ways. And there's a very nice uh, paper from uh, Eric Swanson and uh, Dr. Jim Fujimoto, which talks about the uh, overall impact of OCT. Uh, it has shown the exponential growth in jobs created by this technique, exponential growth in publications, uh, exponential growth in funding. Um, have, it's, in that it has had both academic and industrial impact, which is very noteworthy. Uh, even more interesting is like the, the return on investment which uh, the government has received by public funding in OCT. And there is a, uh, another interesting paper uh, in that regard, which discusses one very specific disease domain where OCT is used. And as I mentioned about uh, age-related macular degeneration, uh, one of the treatments for it is to give an anti-VEGF injection. It's basically to reduce the fluid in the eye by uh, acting as a method to reduce the, uh, the vasculature uh, in and uh, below the retina. The, the standard regime for doing was uh, used to be a fixed treatment where the injection is giving at a certain interval, usually between four to six weeks. With advent of OCT, uh, physicians had an option to realize uh, whether the injection needs to be given or not based on presence of the fluid, because now they could actually see behind the retina and make that decision. And there were two common, there are now two common ways of doing it. One is to have the patient come every four to six weeks, but only give the injection if a fluid is noted behind uh, the retina. The second one is the, the injection is given if the patient is present uh, when the patient shows up, but if the OCT shows they have no fluid, then their visit is extended by two weeks. So you get it at, at four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, and eventually uh, the patient will stop coming. So that reduces the number of treatments for patient. And of course, that's a good thing just for patient comfort, but it has a huge cost factor. Uh, these anti-VEGF injections are $2,000 each, uh, extremely expensive to the public payers. So this work uh, from Vincent and others studied uh, the return on investment that uh, the government received by, uh, on, based on the research which was done on OCT. So they calculate the research funding from NIH and NSF for OCT at 0.4 billion. They looked at the OCT as a word being present on the title and the abstract. They looked at the medical reimbursement for OCT based on the codes. And then they calculated savings for the Medicare based by uh, reducing the additional anti-VEGF injections, which were $2,000 each. And they, with investment of 0.4 billion in research, on just this very specific problem, and OCT has a lot of other applications, the government saved $9 billion. That's a ROI of 21, approximately 2100%. Uh, so that's, that shows importance when a technique does come to market with the, uh, with, while initially being funded by government research, it can have a huge impact economically as well, not to mention all the patients who were living a better life. 
Here's just the graph, the same graph showing uh, the cost for OCT imaging and OCT research and the total Medicare savings coming from it. So, so a very important example of a strong ROI from public funding on OCT research. Uh, OCT has, has in that way become a virtuous cycle with very strong scientific and engineering efforts which have constantly happened, supported by strong clinical research. The technique would have never survived if there wasn't strong clinical backing for it. Then through uh, entrepreneurship and commercial success, which kind of fed into having more public and private funding, and it becomes a virtuous cycle where then we have more uh, research and uh, effort put on the scientific and engineering side. So it's, uh, I think we that's a, a, a snowball effect which has helped this technique and uh, has uh, taken it to a place where it is today. So now we will look at some of the examples of OCT imaging in a specialty clear. I did mention about age-related macular degeneration, one of the leading causes of blinding, uh, blindness in the developed world. Uh, as the name suggests, it's a disease which we get uh, as we get older and affects our macula, which is the center of the eye. That's where we see from. And uh, the, the unfortunate thing is the disease can progress very quickly and we lose the central part of the vision, which uh, we rely heavily on. It has two stages, uh, uh, or I will say broadly two stages, which would be dry AMD, which can have multiple stages within itself and uh, uh, early versus late. And then uh, this converts into what is called wet AMD, where the fluid builds inside the retina and that that's what really impairs the vision. Dry AMD, sometimes patients can have almost uh, no symptoms. Sometimes they will start seeing uh, distortion in their vision. But wet AMD is what is vision threatening and it's prevented by anti-VEGF injections. We'll discuss a little more, a bit more about it. Other applications to ophthalmology is what is called glaucoma. It's uh, the disease of optic, or one should say diseases of optic nerve, which result in uh, loss in nerve fiber. Uh, glaucoma is slightly different uh, compared to AMD in terms of vision loss that it happens more from the periphery and works towards the center. Although different parts of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the different parts of retina can be affected with this loss of uh, nerve fiber layer. OCTs, again, being a three-dimensional technique can be used to measure the nerve uh, fiber layer, which is the top layer we see here. So this is the optic disc. At the cross section, uh, uh, we see a dip in the cross section image, and the brightest layer on the top is the uh, nerve fiber layer. The thickness of that layer tells the health of the nerve fiber, and measuring it over time is an indication of how a patient is doing. Uh, the other application is diabetic retinopathy. In some ways, uh, the, the phenotypes are similar to AMD, although it occurs because of patient being diabetic and developing. Uh, unhealthy and irregular vasculature, which can result again in fluid deposits in the retina and can affect the vision. The other application of OCT, which we talked about was in cardiovascular imaging. Uh, and where it is really used is in on the intravascular side, in case uh, a patient has a a coronary event, which is uh, what we call myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Uh, the physician wants to uh, understand what, uh, you know, what procedure should they uh, go about. One of the most common things to uh, treat the artery is by placing a stent in the artery, which allows uh, more continuous blood flow by expanding the lumen or this uh, the circular part of the artery. The way OCT imaging is done inside the artery is by taking a catheter and then rotating, rotating it inside the artery to look at the walls. And that's why we see this circular type image. Uh, one can argue that there are probably three different ways to use OCT in cardiovascular. One is the diagnostic uh, capability, which comes from OCT by measuring the area of the lumen, uh, looking for thrombus, which are blood clots in the artery, and looking of the fibrous cap rupture, which is a, a event which is very serious for the patient. Uh, then it can be used for planning the procedure, which is to understand whether a stent is needed, where it should be placed, and the size, size and type of stent which the physician should use. 
And then OCT can be used post-procedure to understand how the stent is placed. Uh, a very lucrative uh, business for the companies which have uh, been able to successful to penetrate because each these, uh, each catheter, the catheter has to be, uh, it's basically a disposable and uh, quite expensive piece. So uh, although there are a lot of challenges of using OCT in cardiovascular domain as well. So now we see that all the examples I gave here are in specialty medicine. Uh, those are very important, uh, but they are one can argue they are not the biggest impact. So there are 23,000 ophthalmologists in the United States. By some measures, you get slightly different numbers based on where you look. Uh, there are 3,000 interventional cardiologists, uh, but there are over 200,000 primary care physicians. So it's uh, that the front lines of where the primary care health happens is a much bigger domain. And it's not only in terms of number of providers, but also the number of visits which, which we make naturally. Primary care visits are 10 to 20 times more, possibly even more than that, uh, compared to an ophthalmologist visit. And uh, of course, there are not as many heart attack events as the uh, number of people going to their primary care doctor. So if such optical imaging techniques can be brought to the front lines, their impact would be much higher than it is right now. It is just a graph showing uh, the, the comparison between specialty physician in these two domains versus on the primary care size. So what, what is needed to move a technique into the specialty care, into the front line, sorry. Uh, the uh, argument often is made that the technique has to be low cost. Uh, when you go to your primary care doctor, you normally don't see a lot of digital technologies. There's the things, there are things are very simple and uh, the costs are similar. This visit to a specialty doctor is much more expensive than one to the primary care. So all the most of the instrumentation has much stronger price pressure uh, than in the in the specialty care. Then we also have to look if there's an unmet need in that domain. Like, is there a problem that a digital optical imaging technology can solve? Uh, because you know, if there is a problem which we are solving, but it can only be solved in specialty care, people are not going to adopt it in primary care. So we have to look for the right problems. Um, the workflow and efficiency is important in every uh, kind of medical practice, but is very important in uh, primary care, just because of the number of patients coming to the doctor, this, this, the speed of treatment, the time they have becomes even more critical. Finally, as we discussed before, we cannot rely on having experts to interpret the images in, uh, in the front line. So there has to be ways to make easy interpretation of uh, the output of these technologies. So we'll try to handle each topic one by one and see where the progress has been made and look at some of the examples of some technologies which have come into the front lines. So the low cost is a, a very uh, controversial topic, one can say, and it's, you know, this is, we are not going to get into an economics cl uh, class here, but what does a low cost system mean? Um, and it's, uh, it, one can get into a lot of detail, like what does cost actually mean, right? Like the price of instrument is the net margin over the total cost, where the cost will be the fixed cost, the labor and the bill of materials which go into it. Now we often focus on what are the material costs which go into making it, which is things we are acquiring from our suppliers. And they again are the sum of fixed cost plus margins plus the labor plus the bill of materials. And then that trickles down to their suppliers. And one can argue as we continue, eventually it's raw materials, labors and fixed costs and uh, it's raw materials are uh, stacked with labor fixed uh, margins and the fixed costs which come with them. And all of them scale quite well with the volume and for the labor part, it scales quite well with the automation. So uh, an argument can be made that this volume scaling becomes really important. Of course, this is a simplistic uh, explanation which assumes the, you know, the rational, uh, behavior on each part, the, uh, their, uh, dip, uh, it excludes different kind of barriers which come in. So there's a lot more detail. But the point is that uh, the cost is often a lot more complex than people think. Like we see a complex machine, we think it's going to be expensive. But when it is being taken to 
a domain where it can be deployed in very large volumes, the cost profile becomes very different. Um, so a general approach should be to look, uh, study the cost from first principles, understand what are the drivers, how they can be resolved, if there are some, uh, some really blocking pieces which are making our device expensive. But journal theme should be that we should look to solve a big enough problem. Once the volumes are high, we are solving the big enough problem. Uh, the, the per unit cost or per user cost or per use cost will probably gradually come down. Uh, we shouldn't just assume uh, that whatever we see a price of something is the final cost. There are a lot of other factors. And hopefully you guys appreciate this meme, which often talks about what you read on internet is not true or is true as it was said by Albert Einstein. So it's the, the price texts which we see on internet are not the final cost of the component we are looking at. Okay, so that's the cost part. Now let's come to the problems. What kind of problems can be solved in the frontline care using diagnostic imaging? And there are three ways to look at it. Uh, uh, the, the three types of uh, problems which a diagnostic imaging can solve. One is screening. And what screening means is that we are looking for potential presence of a pathology on for which further evaluation will be required before any intervention or treatment can be done. And what normally means here that your primary care or the frontier doctor evaluates the situation, they say, okay, uh, based on the input I'm getting, what it means that you need to go and see the specialty care. And or what I'm getting is that you don't. And that, so they act as a gateway uh, for who should go to specialty and who shouldn't. And that really streamlines the healthcare process. The other is monitoring, which means that some pathology may be detected and but before an intervention can be done, the patient should be monitored on a periodic basis. An example of this is what we discussed is from dry to wet AMV conversion, for instance. A patient with dry AMD is monitored on a regular basis. And when we see presence of fluid, we actually make an intervention. And the other one is pure diagnosis, which means a problem is recognized and the treatment can be done by the same physician who is diagnosing the problem. So in primary care, all these three things can happen. So we will uh, look at examples of each of them using some of the optical imaging technologies. So for screening, I will give an example of ear infection diagnosis uh, or what is called otitis media. Ear infections are one of the most, uh, they are the most common reasons for the, uh, which the kids visit their doctors other than their wellness visits. Uh, we spent about $10 billion on ear infections and uh, the 50% of cases in primary care are misdiagnosed based on this uh, publication from Picacro and Poole. It's, it's uh, most primary care doctors will accept the fact that diagnosis of uh, uh, ear infection is done very poorly. What that results is in having very high use of antibiotic use uh, or antibiotic misuse, one should say. And th what, uh, the way it plays out in real life is parents take their kids to the doctor, they, they have some kind of ear pain, parents want some kind of response from the doctor and they look using their otoscope on the surface of the eardrum and they're not sure and they just provide, they give antibiotics to make the parent feel good. But what this in the end ends up resulting is in high use of antibiotics and increase in antibiotic resistance. But there is also a challenge uh, of the ear wax being present and it's very hard to see the surface of the eardrum to make a conclusion. So as we can see, the, the infection lies behind the eardrum. The, surface imaging tools which we have only can look at the eardrum. So we are deducing what's behind the eardrum uh, based on how the surface of the eardrum looks. And that is not easy to do and becomes even more difficult when the ear wax is present. So an OCT based technique has been, and this is an example of the eardrum with ear wax. You have very small region to see through it and to make any diagnosis. So an OCT based technique has been developed with to actually um, make a more quantitative and objective diagnosis of, uh, of uh, the presence of ear infection. And uh, this is a device called Autosite, which comes from the company named Photonic Care. I, I worked for them before my current position. And uh, the device basically helps the physician see behind the eardrum using OCT 
and distinguish between uh, whether a fluid whether fluid is present and if it is present then how turbid it is which to some degree is an indication whether it's a bacterial infection or there is more watery fluid which may not be an indicative of uh, a bacterial infection one, here are some of the examples of how such a uh, imaging technique looks. So here is the surface of the eardrum. In the OCT cross section, this is the, the bright line is the surface of the eardrum and this area is below the eardrum. So here when we see a very clear back area, that means that uh, this uh, region is without middle ear effusion. Uh, there is no fluid present here. And these are the uh, uh, pathological cases where behind the eardrum we see scattering, which means there is fluid present there. And uh, that indicates uh, most likely presence of infection. So this gives a very objective way for the physician and also the parent to see, this being a digital technique, the, the physician can see, show the parent what they're exactly uh, seeing and can say, you know, you can see it's very clear behind the eardrum. We don't need to give antibiotic and the parent goes home much more satisfied rather than a uh, physician just looking into the ear through their otoscope and saying yes or no, uh, when the parent has no way to know what the physician looked at. Here's an example of what happens when the earwax is present. So in a surface uh, image, it's very hard to say what is behind the eardrum, but with OCT, even if a little bit of opening is present, one can see through the eardrum and deduce if any fluid may or may not be present behind. So up to 90% occlusion, one can actually uh, get the uh, condition of the ear, ear behind the ear. Uh, the, the autocyte device, which uses OCT for ear infection diagnosis is a class two device. It's cleared by FDA. There are uh, uh, CPT three ports for reimbursement, which means that um, the, the Medicare does not consider it to be a must for reimbursement, but there are uh, there are courts available against which the physicians can uh, charge for use of this technology. And we will see these, these are extremely important uh, parameters for a technology being adopted. Reimbursement becomes a, uh, a key factor whether a digital imaging technology or for, in, for that matter, any other technology will be adopted in healthcare because physicians are spending their time uh, it slows down their workflow. So reimbursement is an extremely important factor. Then the second example is managing a disease from home. And I will use the example of home OCG uh, here. And this, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to work on this device, uh, parts of this device when I was at Vasaj Photonics for uh, Notal Vision. Uh, this is a self-operated OCT for home use. Uh, there are ongoing clinical trials which have shown for till now 90% of AMD patients could operate after a two minute uh, training. The idea is uh, for such a device that an AMD patient can have it at their home. They, they take their OCT images at a prescribed interval. The images are sent to the cloud and an AI based technology looks for the presence of fluid in the eye and if a fluid is found, then uh, through a well-defined logistic mechanism, their physician are informed, and then the patient can be called in for treatment. So we looked at earlier how OCT has personalized the treatment of AMD uh, before by use, by its use in the specialty care, but by use it in home care, it can make it even more effective. And uh, the devices, uh, uh, the, the device is still not FDA approved, but it uh, has a uh, getting very good reviews from uh, the experts in the field. So in regards to reimbursement, the device did get a breakthrough designation for FDA, which, uh, which is uh, the case when FDA considers that the device is of great value. And uh, the, there are CPD three reimbursement codes uh, established for use of this device as well. And the third technology which we will look at is related to screening. So we looked at diagnosis through ear infections, uh, management through uh, home use of OCT, and then there is a vision pediatric vision screening product which is uh, based on photo screening. So the idea of photo screening is basically that we have a camera and a uh, light source which are offset with each other, and if the light goes through the eye, which is 
which has perfect, which, where there is no refractive error, that means that the lens focuses the light right on the retina, then we see what is a natural red reflex, a circular spot in the middle of the retina. But if there is refractive error, we will see the spot either move up or down based on whether it's a myopic effect. That means that the lens power is higher than it should be for good focusing or it's a hyperopic effect where the lens power is less than it should be. The direction of movement is dependent on how the light source is offset with respect to the camera. So uh, this is a, just an example for an internal paper where we can see that uh, the we shine the light at different part, uh, on the eye and we, for different powers the light will uh, the red reflex will change and then after doing some calculations on that red reflex image one can get a rough estimate of the uh, refractive state of the eye and the reason such a technique is used is because the younger kids where this screening is important cannot read an eye chart like like adults can. Uh, it is considered quite important uh, for detecting amblopia, which is, or what we call lazy eye, which is considered to be one of the most uh, preventable causes for vision loss. Um, in fact, the studies show that uh, eye screening is such a simple and low cost procedure, which has a, such a high impact that it's uh, considered to be one of the most low hanging fruit in terms of prevent, preventing vision loss. And uh, what one looks for is refractive error, uh, which is if uh, you know there is some any power uh, mismatch or any power uh, other than zero in the eye that can detect myopia, which uh, a lot of younger kids have these days. It looks for anisotropia, which means that two eyes have different power, which can be a cause for amblopia, because if you have one eye, which sees a lot more clearly than the other one, then the, your brain starts to use that eye a lot more compared to another one. Strabismus, which is the cross eye where the eye muscles are not well coordinated. And again, it can be a uh, indication for uh, or a uh, cause for amblopia. And uh, something which is diagnosed, uh, which if diagnosed should or if it's screened for should uh, uh, be used to refer the child to a specialist. Uh, Given the importance of these devices, they are actually re reimbursed because these are for kids. Obviously, there is no uh, Medicare reimbursement, but the private insurance and Medicaid come into play. Um, and I think it was in the 2012 or uh, 2008 ACA plan uh, actually um, ensured that uh, the private insurance should have coverage for vision screening. These are class 2A devices, which means they are 510K exempt, so they are easier to bring to the market. Um, now, we, so we look at the two techniques, we look at how images are required can be used. The third thing which we had mentioned, which is challenging to uh, uh, for bringing a digital imaging technology to the front lines is the interpretation of data. And, in remaining of the slides, I will talk a little bit about role of artificial intelligence. It's a, a term which is thrown around everywhere these days. Uh, I know, you know, it's a more hardware focused group. I will try to bring uh, a little bit of like what's happening in the artificial intelligence world. How, what does it mean for imaging? Um, how much is the reality and how much is the hype around it? So uh, we'll try to try to discuss a little bit about that. So. Uh, I don't know, like it's very hard to avoid listening uh, about the boom in the AI world. Uh, uh, everything related to it uh, is going exponentially. It's much faster than those charts I showed for OCT. The startups uh, which uh, are related to AI have gone, grown exponentially. These All this data come from AI Index, uh, published, I think, led through MIT for publication. Uh, the private companies, investment in AI systems, uh, the job openings related to AI, uh, the number of patterns which are being filed globally related to AI, all of them are going exponentially, the, the research publications. So uh, let's discuss like, what's, uh, like what has been driving some of this growth and what does it mean for interpretation of images and their use in, um, uh, in front lines of healthcare. So for our uh, case, when we talk of imaging, really the part of AI which is of 
interest is one can say computer vision, which is you take a digital image and you can a computer interpret the image in a similar fashion as a human being will. And there are a few key fundamentals if we think about what when what do we mean by interpretation of image. And uh, you want to know what's in the image, you want to know where it is, and what is, what is the relationship between the objects which are present in the image. One can argue what, where, and the relationship pretty much defines the whole image. That's the grammar of the image. So there is a contest, or there used to be a contest called ImageNet, and which kind of try to answer this problem to, to identify what is present in the image. And for our purposes, let's say we look at the image of the eye and we want to say whether diabetic retinopathy is present or not. ImageNet, what it had was there are were 40 million labeled images in 20,000 different categories. And those categories were like birds and trees and cars and people. And there was an annual contest which was held to see the accuracy of different computer algorithms in terms of detecting what's present in that image. So here will be some kind of output. If there is a bird and a frog present, then your algorithm should be able to tell there is a bird and there is a frog and idly draw a box around where they are present. And this is a very core uh, computer vision problem and it can be extended to any kind of applications. So this is how things were around 2010. When you show these ImageNet data to humans, of course there is some variance and there are errors present. So you get about 5% accuracy, 5% error rate when us people look at the ImageNet data and try to say what's in the, what's in the pictures. For computers, the error rate used to be around 25%. The, so that 25% is the, uh, the best performing algorithm in 2010. The number was very similar, uh, just one or 2% better in 2011. But a big change came in 2012 when the error rate fell by about more than 10% uh, using a neural network algorithm from University of Toronto. And this kind of opened up the eyes of the world. Like this is a huge, sudden, huge improvement in performance. The, the neural network was called AlexNet based after the name of the first author. And it, uh, uh, it came from a lab of Jeffrey Hinton in, at University of Toronto. Uh, next year, the results improved even further, coming closer to 10%. Uh, the, I think the winners were clarified. They were associated with uh, Columbia University in New York, used a model very similar to AlexNet, but uh, optimized it by learning how actually it was performing. Now, by this time, the big players started coming into the picture. So this was an eight layer neural network and we will talk a little more about uh, what that means. In 2014, Google came into play with their strong computers. They trained a 32 layer neural network and they were at 7% accuracy. And in 2015, Microsoft Research uh, actually beat the human accuracy. So the computer was better at detecting uh, what is present in the op object compared to the humans themselves. Uh, so this 152 layer neural network had a 3.5% accuracy. And then computers continue to beat uh, humans in 2016 and 2017. And after that, I think this contest was stopped because the accuracy of the best algorithms was so good, there was no point doing it any further. So this, uh, we can see that to, uh, in last eight or 10 years, the capability of computer vision, artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, has significantly improved and there is some real merit to it. So uh, what have been the technical drivers behind this improvement uh, in the AI and machine learning algorithms? And one can argue there have been three big factors. One is the algorithms, which these neural networks are computer algorithms, which uh, perform in a certain way, their optimization, the type of algorithms used, how they are trained, uh, those factors have significantly improved and have been a reason for the improvement. Uh, the neural networks are basically uh, nodes uh, which uh, are uh, do multiplication and summation and one provides them some input and the right answer, which is the output. And the nodes are trained such to bring the input, uh, to, to bring the answer as close as possible to the right answer. And by presenting multiple input and outputs, this equation is solved and the values of those multipliers and uh, adders are updated to 
towards the final version of the neural network, which is called a trained neural network. And then you present it a new input and it should give you the right answer. The more complex the neural network, that is the more nodes it has, the more complex of a problem it can theoretically solve. So what we are really trying to build is a nonlinear equation and trying to optimize these parameters. That's the real power of a neural network that it's not doing a linear computation by these combinations, but it's a nonlinear, uh, a nonlinear computer. So algorithms have been one factor. The second has been presence of data. What is important for neural networks, we need a lot of data to train it. And until we had simpler algorithms, having more data did not help a lot because a simpler neural network kind of saturates uh, with even if you have more data present for it. But as more and more complex algorithms were developed, having more data actually helped them. So there was a synergy between the complexity of the algorithm and presence of more data. And as we know, we have had more data as more and more things have been digitized in every different field, including in medical imaging. And the third driving factor has been the hardware. To train these very large neural networks, we need uh, extremely complex hardware. Uh, often we need parallel processing and the use of GPUs has been a big factor in ability to use uh, the complex neural network. The AlexNet paper from University of Toronto, I think one of the key differentiators there was the use of uh, GPUs to be able to train that neural network, which was around only eight uh, layers, I think, or six layers. Uh, as neural networks got more and more complex, the companies with stronger hardware came into picture using more parallel processing to train them. Neural networks do lend themselves very well to parallel processing. In fact, uh, they are called a problem which is embarrassingly parallel because it can be uh, very easily uh, used in a parallel processing computer uh, to optimize for the speed. So these are the three key factors, technically speaking, which have driven the growth in uh, machine learning and AI applications and have uh, provided benefits in medical imaging. Uh, so some of the key applications have been around segmentation, classification, and enhancement of uh, these images. Uh, when we look at medical imaging, these are some of the key parameters which come into play. I will not go into details. There is an interesting paper here, uh, which was from Google's DeepMind, once you take a look at it, which showed the performance of the algorithm being uh, better than that of expert physicians. So I will not go into the detail of that description in absence of time, but go to the results slide, which uh, where uh, the physicians were shown the data, and this was their performance in terms of detecting pathology and the train, so you can see retina specialists obviously did better than the optometrist, but the, uh, and this was a performance when they looked at both the OCT and a fundus image, which is the 2D image at the back of the eye, and the machine performance just looking at an OCT image was actually better than uh, all the specialists and the optometrist combined. So uh, a very powerful demonstration of using AI-based methods to interpret the images and potentially make some diagnosis. Uh, there's, uh, there are applications in image enhancement. Uh, this is a very interesting paper. Here is a camera output with an ISO setting at 8,000 and we almost see nothing. When we increase the ISO settings uh, because of low light, we can now with increased ISO settings, we can see things, but obviously the image is noisy and not. Using this image A and a trained neural network, the, the authors show reconstruction of this image. So this is the input image and this is the output image. And it's, uh, it's pretty mind boggling and uh, there are other examples in the paper. This is basically the com that comes from the fact of training a lot of very poorly taken images with what would be the image in good light conditions and reconstructing them. And the same idea has been implemented in medical imaging to enhance the images as well. So a lot of other examples, uh, and again, I will jump through these so we give some time for questions as well. So some of the key examples of the neural networks are paired, AlexNet, VGGNet, InceptionNet, ResNet are some of the famous uh, neural networks. You may hear them being used around, very important for medical imaging and are uh, uh, will be used in different fashions for different applications. I do like to always 
give a word of caution around uh, when people talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this is a quote from a publication. In spite of all the commercial hustle and bustle around AI these days, there's a mood that I'm sure many of you are familiar with of deep unease among AI researchers who have been around more than last four years or so. The unease is due to the worry that perhaps the expectations about AI are too high and this will eventually result in disaster. And this is not like a quote written in the last couple of years. This is actually a uh, conference publication from 1984. And we have seen this, uh, the excitement of AI come several times in late 50s and 60s and 80s. And often uh, if there was a lot more hyperbole, there was some good, there was some good science and good engineering and we have to be careful around it. So with that, I will say the key, the key pillars around which uh, we see moving a lot of specialty medical imaging technologies towards the front lines are related to one, focusing on real unmet needs, what matters to the physicians, reimbursement and workflow, making the interpretation and ease of use at the core, uh, having algorithms or other ways to make sure that the images which are taken can be interpreted and uh, making sure that uh, the cost and complexity of the devices are such that uh, they can be adopted in those frontline settings. So this is the summary of uh, my work. And as I had mentioned, uh, my current uh, empire is looking for filling a plot of positions. So please feel free to uh, look at the website and uh, contact me or the, the carriers uh, email if uh, you or any people you know are interested. In. So uh, that's all from my side and I can uh, pass it over to Hillary.